from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, it is the worst stock sell-off in two years. A late afternoon drop after a surprisingly high inflation report. Tech hit hard. We'll tell you how. Plus, Twitter shareholders approve Musk's $44 billion buyout as the former head of security testifies on Capitol Hill, saying Twitter's executives are misleading the public and security risks are a ticking time bomb. What it means for Musk's attempt to get out of the deal. And my one-on-one -on -one with Melinda French Gates on a new report from the Gates Foundation that shows the world isn't doing so great. We also talk about the changing philanthropic landscape, how she's taking action post-Roe, and her relationship with Bill. We're going to get to all of that in a moment, but first let's get a look at the markets and stocks plunging, especially tech. Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow joining us now. Ed, what happened? Yeah, full focus on the August CPI consumer price index or inflation print, which came in hotter than expected. We built up anticipation that inflation would be cooling off. It didn't. And now full focus on the Fed meeting next week. You look at the Nasdaq 100, S&P 500. In fact, the main gauge of U.S. equity, the S&P 500, had its biggest drop since June 2020. The Nasdaq 100, such a tech-heavy index, having its biggest drop since March 16th, 2020. And M, you and I remember that day so well in the context of the pandemic era. There was a push higher in yields and Bitcoin kind of caught up in this broader risk-off sentiment, down 10%, dropping from 22,500 U.S. dollars per token, back down to towards 20,000 US dollars per token. Look, we're really reconsidering where we stand with the Fed. If you look at my terminal chart, we look at what happened. This is the story of the day, the white line, expectations of where we'll end the year in the context of rates shooting up, the S&P 500 coming down, how quickly the psychology of the market can change. If you want more superlatives, M, look no further than Apple. Apple having its biggest drop since uh, earlier this year, March of this year, but w wiping out $150 billion, US dollars from its market cap. It was off the back of a four-day Nasdaq rally, such confidence around Apple, that surge in the stock after the stronger-than-expected data for pre-orders of the iPhone 14. Elsewhere, Twitter, a real anomaly in the market, up eight-tenths of 1%. But, of course, we're going to cover the reasons behind that throughout the show. And I flagged Peloton down 10% in the session. But you remember after hours on Monday, it actually rose on news that John Foley, the founder, was leaving the company. But the market kind of changing its mind, caught up in that broader risk-off sentiment throughout the day. All right, Ed, thanks for that breakdown. We'll check in with you again later in the show. I want to dig further into this sell-off and what it means. Victoria Green is the Chief Investment Officer at G Squared Private Wealth. She joins us now. Victoria, what do you make of this? And so suddenly in the session. Uh, today was when uh, reality met expectations on inflation, and I think the market had gone into this. Maybe the Fed isn't pivoting, but we're definitely at peak inflation, and today was a, a wake-up and a, a cold slap that inflation is still here, and it's very, very sticky inflation. It's no longer just about energy. I think the surprise on food and housing, medical expenses, veterinary care, a lot of areas that we thought was getting better really weren't. So I think today was a step back into the reality. Now, number one, the Fed's going to go 75 basis points. Number two, a 4% terminal rate may be too low. And number three, we're still in a sticky inflationary environment that may prove to be difficult to bring down, especially food prices right now. What do you make of what happened with tech in particular? What distinguishes the tech part of this sell-off from the rest of the sell-off? Sure. Well, so tech stocks tend to be very growthy stocks, higher multiples, promising higher than, than market growth, right? That's why you buy them. They're supposed to grow faster, but you're paying more today for a dollar of future earnings. And every time you see something like this where real rates are rising, the Fed is hiking, it really kind of checks of how long of a duration stock do you want? You kind of want stocks that are rewarding you for owning them now. And most tech stocks tend to be needing growth and, and promising further future growth. So right now, it's kind of a show me, like what can, what, what 
what kind of income can you produce for me? How successful are you? And you didn't see anybody that was immune from it today. It was a total washout on tech and, and any of them, including the, the Apples and the Microsofts of the world, but you have to consider very blue chip tech stocks did not hold up well. And we saw like the semiconductor sector really take some more pain today. And I think a lot of that is repricing expectations for global growth. The fact we're going to be in a high key inflationary environment and the fact that it's a very very, very high probability this continues to slow down and that puts pressure like we saw with NVIDIA. If we see PC and gaming slow down, people are, are not upgrading their computers as frequently. That's just going to put pressure on heating the growth multiples they need to go because the worst thing you want to do is own a growth stock that stops growing because then what do you really own? You own a dud. So the big question is, of course, are the markets going to be back up tomorrow? What do you think, or is this, could today be some sort of turning point to a further drop, a more prolonged drop in markets? We yeah, we unfortunately do see this as a bear market rally that we're going to retest our lows. You know, we did see the supports hold around 3,900 on the S&P 500. So you do have a little bit of a support there. But I think as we digest, you really have about a week now between now and when the Fed speaks. And I think people are going to get very nervous about what the Fed's going to do. You saw some traders talking about 100 basis points. You know, is it going to be 50 and 50 to end out the year? And this really this reality of the tightening cycle. And then step back, not just about the United States, but about what other other economies around the world are doing, how much they're tightening rates, what that may do for adjustable rate mortgages. You know, in the US, we're only about 7% adjustable rate now, but now in Australia, the UK, Spain, they're very much higher adjustable rate and they're going to be hit with these interest rates. So I think it's too early to buy the dip. At some point, we'll hit oversold again, but I think we're going to retest down to the 36, 3400s. You might get a relief rally, but don't get FOMO about the market going up. I think you got more downside pressure. So how are you deciding or changing uh, potential decisions about where you park your money and how much of it goes into growthy, uh, to use your word, tech and not? I think right now it's more the value play, the blue chip play. We want stocks that have defensible moats. You know, what are their cash flows going to look like if the world continues to slow? The problem with the core inflation rising is it really directly pressures the consumers. There's nowhere to hide. Doesn't matter if you're eating out or at the grocery store. You know, and we had some factors that are going to make food worse. You know, the, the avian flu that has caused the shortage. So eggs and chicken are more expensive. I think you really want to hide in quality stocks. Also, the land of Tina, right? There is no alternative. As these treasury yields come up, suddenly you kind of do have an alternative to park some in some really short treasury bills. Don't want to take any duration risk. But if you look across the landscape, you now have treasury bills yielding well above uh, the average dividend yield. And we know those are going to keep coming up. So the world of Tina is also rotating. And you may see a flight to, to safety. You saw the two-year yields hit the highest in 15 years. You're seeing a lot of pressure on the rates market. But if you hide at that very short end, you may be able to make some money as you wait out the worst of this. All right, Victoria Green, G Squared, Private Wealth. Always good to have you, Victoria. Thanks for breaking it down. Coming up, all you need to know about testimony from the Twitter whistleblower and what it means for Elon Musk. That is next. This is Bloomberg. It took me maybe uh, 30 minutes to reach out to an employee and say, what do we know about this person? And then it only took that person maybe 10 minutes to get back to me and said, OK, here's who they are. This is the address where they live. This is where they are physically at this moment. They're on their phone. We know their phone number. We also know all of the other accounts that they've tried to set up on the system and hide. And we know who they are on the other social media platforms as well. kind of testimony from former Twitter executive turned whistleblower Peter Zatko. Zatko slamming Twitter's management, its operations, and calling its security risks a ticking time bomb. Here's some of what he told the Senate Judiciary Committee. Twitter leadership is misleading the public, lawmakers, regulators, and even its own board of directors. What I discovered when I joined Twitter was that this enormously influential company was over a decade behind industry security standards. To put it bluntly, Twitter leadership ignored its, ignored its engineers because key parts of leadership lacked the competency to understand the scope of the problem. But more importantly, 
Their executive incentives led them to prioritize profits over security. They don't know what data they have, where it lives, or where it came from, and so, unsurprisingly, they can't protect it. And this leads to the second problem, which is the employees then have to have too much access to too much data and to too many systems. There was not an easy ability for me to find which engineers had logged into which systems and what, and what data that they had accessed. I did explain this to Mr. Dorsey. Uh, my understanding is he did not understand this prior to bringing me in, and that was one of the reasons that he Does wanted to Does he understand to it now? I believe after seeing How this How about hearing, your CEO? Does he understand this? Um, I believe since he has been there for 10 years and what, rose up through the ranks in engineering, and he has talked to the engineers, and, and they have told him. Yes. I, I believe yes. I'm reminded of one conversation with an executive when I said, I am confident that we have a foreign agent, and their response was, well, since we already have one, what does it matter if we have more? Let's keep growing the office. Here to discuss, Adam Kavakovich, Chamber of Progress founder and CEO, as well as Bloomberg's own Alex Baringa, who covered the hearing today on our live blog. Adam, I, I want to start with you. What was your initial reaction to Zach Goh's testimony? Seemed like not a good day for Twitter. Yeah, he claimed that the company's security was lacking. I think the company, we know the company has disputed that in detail, and, and others have pointed out it was his responsibility to strengthen the security in this role. This question of whether the company's security is sufficient, I think, will ultimately be one for the Federal Trade Commission to determine. I will say that when I worked within tech companies, you know, no company likes, ha likes having their internal disputes and challenges aired publicly. That may be especially true here, given that there were clearly conflicts between Peter Zatko and Parag uh, Agrawal. But ideally, when the dust settles, you know, companies can often learn from criticism and improve from it. I think with, with security, the, it's a hard topic because despite the kind of the political table pounding, the reality is nuanced. Twitter has had a few uh, high profile hacks, but they're, they're not a regular occurrence. And I think in the realm of security, you know, every day without a hack of which Twitter has had many is a success. Of course, there's no prize for a day without without breaches. Could, could most companies, including Twitter, do more to su improve security? Almost certainly. Does Twitter do security better than most companies? Almost certainly. Alex, what were your big takeaways about, you know, sort of the big revelations here and, uh, you know, what this might actually mean for its dispute with Elon Musk, given that it didn't seem like bots and spam, which is his, his main point of contention, really came up? Yeah, so I'll start with the takeaways that are not Musk related. Uh, related to what Adam was saying, there was a lot of, a lot of political table pounding and a lot of calls for uh, increased enforcement, increased regulation. And Emily, there are some kind of surprising allies in those calls. You saw folks like uh, Lindsey Graham, the Republican from South Carolina, aligning with Elizabeth Warren, uh, the Democrat from Massachusetts, saying we're working on something to um, uh, better regulate tech companies. You heard Amy Klobuchar and Chuck Grassley also lean into this idea and Senator Blumenthal actually suggests that maybe we need a new regulatory agency to regulate big tech. All of that um, is very much in the realm of D.C. and this ongoing conversation of the role of big tech and uh, where regulation comes in. The Elon Musk part um, kind of plays into a little bit of that, what we heard from Zatko, in terms of um, what he described as almost a cultural um, kind of aspect of the company, uh, where he said the company kind of fights fires, moves from fire to fire, um, was the quote, uh, makes short-term changes, isn't thinking long-term about security. Uh, they're only really thinking long-term about growing revenue and users. So um, that point right there, Emily, even though it's not specifically um, one of the three reasons why Elon has given to back out of the deal, um, I think that would be the one that Musk might be most interested in. Uh, he has kind of leaned on this idea that the board um, and the executive have misrepresented data. So while we didn't hear a lot about bots or spam accounts, uh, that cultural element might be the one that we see pulled into the argument that Musk is poised to take hmm. into court in October. Interesting. Adam, what do you make of that? Our Bloomberg intelligence analysts have concluded they don't think this testimony will have a material adverse impact on Twitter's attempt to hold 
Musk to this deal. They still think there's a, a 70% uh, chance this deal goes through. Um, you know, what do you think about what Zatko said that could potentially rise to the level of impacting whether or not this deal happens at all? Well, I'm not a stock analyst. I do agree. One of the things that was surprising to me was the extent to which the bots question really didn't come up today. And that was surprising to me because in the past, one of the things we have seen a lot of is particularly Republicans in Congress fairly eager to uh, talk about Twitter in a way that you know is, is very much in line with Musk's goals. And so that was a bit of a surprise for me. But I don't think that uh, I, I, you know, I think that that is really a separate process, right? And what was unique to me about this was interesting because I compared this a lot to uh, the Francis Haugen testimony last year around Facebook, which I think led policymakers to in introduce a number of bills. There were eight different bills introduced last year as a result of the Haugen testimony, mostly dealing with social media. But today's testimony was really uniquely about Twitter and its security practices. I think that question is most likely to be looked at in great detail by the Federal Trade Commission. And then the question of bots, really, which didn't come up today, is, as we know, a, a central question of the litigation that, that the companies engaged with Musk. So I don't think that there wasn't anything necessarily new today that came out of the hearing that I think changes the direction of that litigation. Well, and comparing it to Francis Haugen's testimony, um, you know, it, that was really impactful, seemed to have a, a significantly adverse effect on uh, Facebook, which, you know, has since changed its name uh, and, and has, has been, you know, still working on um, trying to clean up its reputation in, in part in response to that. And of course, other things. Um, you know, uh, one more question about the Elon Musk part of this. Um, Alex, Twitter uh, has responded saying they're, they stand ready and willing to complete the merger with Elon Musk. They say 98.6% of shareholders today approved uh, Elon Musk doing this deal. That was expected. But, you know, Twitter still, Twitter's still saying, we're going to make this happen, whether you like it or not. Yeah, it's a it's a funny situation, Emily. Right, um, where the owner could be um, a, a man who has now um, had uh, three ticks in the "I don't want to do this deal" bucket. Um, I, I think that that shareholder uh, approval that you saw today is significant. Um, it was expected, but it is significant um, that at least that very large majority thinks that this is the best uh, kind of path forward for shareholder value for this company. Um, but certainly, Emily, we'll, we'll be following the play-by-play -play, uh, going into October. We've already seen a little bit of drama. The judge coming to Musk saying you need to give up your text messages. Uh, the judge going to Twitter saying you need to reveal more data. So there's certainly going to be um, uh, more fencing back and forth as we go into the next couple of months here. Um, but this at least is kind of another um, checkbox for this deal to continue uh, to that litigious end that we're set on right now. Now, Adam, one of the interesting things that Zatko said is that Twitter is more concerned about foreign regulators than U.S. regulators. What did you make of that? And, it, and, and if it'll goad uh, potentially the FTC into taking more aggressive action or other regulators? Yeah, as you, as you pointed out, the FTC has an existing consent decree uh, that's 11 years old with Twitter, it will surely take a close look at whether um, it is living under the terms of that. But I don't think there's any doubt. One of the things that was a t big topic of conversation today was whether the federal government has enough resources. You saw Lindsey Graham talking about, let's create a new agency. But the reality is that we're not funding the agencies we have. The FTC, last year there was a proposal, for example, by the Biden administration to create a whole new bureau at the FTC focusing on privacy and data security. And that's a very good idea. But unfortunately, Republicans killed that proposal, right? That was going to be a billion dollars in more funding, including some of the same Republicans who were complaining today about the FTC not doing uh, enough. So there's a lot more policymakers can do. They can also pass a consumer privacy bill. They've been stalling on that. And the FTC has been looking at this question of issuing more comprehensive data security rules for all companies to follow. They've been reluctant to do that. They, they prefer instead to reach settlements with individual companies. But the problem is that it doesn't set clear security uh, rules for other companies to follow. They've just recently kicked off a rulemaking, and I think there's a good case to be made that that rulemaking should focus as much on data security uh, as on privacy. Uh, Alex, what's next? Uh, we're now about a month away from the day that this trial is supposed to start. Elon Musk v. Twitter. Yeah. 
We are. Um, what's next is, is going to be continuing this kind of evidentiary process for them uh, against this backdrop of what's going on in D.C. Emily, um, you know, there's a Homeland Security hearing tomorrow where one of Twitter's executives will be there alongside Meta, YouTube and TikTok execs as well. So I think um, for Twitter, they'll have these kind of um, dueling, perhaps distractions, um, uh, big ones at that for whether or not this deal gets done with Musk. Uh, we saw that Musk was uh, watching today. He was tweeting perhaps a little bit cheekily, um, but we do know that with Elon Musk, sometimes the jokes do turn serious. Um, so I'm sure that there will be continue to be um, kind of bobs and weaves on that side of the deal, as well in as in D.C. in terms of uh, if there is any kind of action here. Um, to Adam's point, after Francis Haugen, the Facebook whistleblower, did um, you know go down to Washington, there were a lot of bills proposed. There hasn't been a ton of significant changes yet. So if there is any moves on the kind of political worry side on data privacy. Um, if history is any guide, those might be a little bit slower than what we might see on the than the uh, the deal that is expected to go to court in October. All right, Bloomberg's Alex Barinka, Adam Kavakovich of the Chamber of Progress. Thank you both for your commentary today. Obviously, we're going to continue to watch every twist and turn. We will be right back. This is Bloomberg. Meta says it needs its rivals to share some of their most closely held secrets in order to defend its antitrust suit. Meta has subpoenaed 132 companies for documents including Snap, TikTok, and Clubhouse. Meta says this will help its argument against the FTC's 2020 lawsuit claiming the company has a monopoly in social networking. A trial isn't likely until 2024 at the earliest. And it was a huge night for streamers, particularly HBO and Apple at the Emmys last night. Warner Brothers Discovery, it's HBO taking home 12 awards, mostly thanks to Succession and White Lotus, and Apple took home the top comedy award for Ted Lasso. Netflix scoring three Emmy wins, including Outstanding Lead Actor for Squid Game. The Emmys have become a focal point of the competition between the largest media and tech companies and their streaming services. Up next, it is the sharpest drop in markets since the onset of the pandemic. We're going to have much more on the evolving tech outlook after Tuesday's sell-off. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Let's get back to the markets and the tech tumble and more with our Ed Bloodlow. Ed, what are you watching? Yeah, we just want to hammer home on this idea that it was really tech that suffered after that August CPI print, the most speculative corners of the market, but also just the fact that tech, information technology and communication services, the worst performing subsectors on the S&P 500, as you said, the S&P 500 having its worst day since June of 2020, and, you know, the, the concern here is about higher rates, right? The market priced in a 75 basis point hike at the next Fed meeting next week. There are already voices in the market talking about 100 basis point hikes. And as we know, especially profitless technology are most vulnerable to higher rates because they discount the present value of future profits. That's how we've been valuing these, these companies. But we thought that a lot of what the Fed would do was priced in. So, yes, the more speculative areas of the market. But we bring up this next list of movers basically it's the mega caps that also really suffered they are sometimes seen as defensive stocks 
uh, because of their strong balance sheets and also just because of their reputation as being quality in a hostile environment. Many of these names, Apple, Microsoft, specifically Apple, right, the games we've seen in recent days, have shown staying power in the face of inflation. The iPhone 14 prelim data for pre-orders, really strong. But they were not spared. We saw all corners of the tech sector hit today in this sell-off. And I thought it was interesting that those mega caps were hit as well. All right, Ed, thanks. Look at all that red. I want to stick with the tech downturn, bringing Robert Cantwell, portfolio manager at Up Holdings. Robert, how are you moving your money around right now after a day like today? Well, relative to earlier this year when we kept watching tech fall, uh, today the entire market fell with it. Uh, so that's a little bit of a different setup for investors. And you've, you've got a lot of investor conferences going on right now. The software companies are reporting uh, reasonably strong numbers. They're not softening their guidance. They're not pre-announcing uh, a bad quarter. So we have we have yet to hear on the micro side of things from what companies are reporting that things have in fact worsened. Uh, but what what you're continuing to see is these multiples are moving around really fast. And you know that came from the the ten year uh, interest uh, rate expectations being the highest they've been in twelve years. And, and so we've seen that hit tech the hardest because as as you covered, you know these multiples have come down a lot. But we still see some pockets of expensiveness in tech. So we don't think the market is necessarily bottomed everywhere. Where are the pockets? <laughs> well, you've got Snowflake uh, still at, at, at 30 times uh, revenue. And it's, a, it's an excellent company with an excellent product. And, and their customers are really excited about giving the company more money. But they're also plowing every dollar of gross profit into sales and marketing. So you know, as we've been talking more about this profitless tech, um, we've been we've been seeing the, the the tech universe splinter here a bit, where you've got companies that let's say streaming and e-commerce uh, that have been showing low returns on on investment for for years now, and it's unlikely that that those companies uh, are going to recover because Amazon building another fulfillment center is not actually generating a lot of cash flow back to Amazon. But on the other side of the spectrum, with what Meta's building, with what's Google Google's building. Every dollar that Google puts into CapEx or, or new uh, headcount, they see 60 more cents of operating cash flow in the next year. So we see two worlds forming uh, within the tech universe here with, with, with those that are generating you know, real incremental positive returns and are rapidly shifting our portfolio there as quickly as we can. So the question remains, of course, how much worse is this going to get? I mean, a lot of people thought that you know, Jay Powell was bluffing, and I wonder if this is some... Uh, vindication for him and for the Fed, and does it make you more inclined to say, yes, we're heading into a recession? Well, to if we're, we're going to talk economics, it, it does. The more credibility that Jay Powell has, uh, the better off the U.S. dollar is. And what what happened since his last uh, couple of, of hawkish comments was he said, no matter how things may be looking like they're going to improve. I'm going to stay stubborn with my interest rate hikes. And what the market did over the past few weeks is they, they heard those comments. And they thought, wow, is inflation really going to get better? Because that's good for everybody. And you saw the market trade up. We were up almost 5.5% this month going into today. And now we're starting over today as if the month is starting all over again. So I think that, that Jay Powell has absolutely rebuilt some of the credibility that he lost in being behind the curve you know, a year or so ago. And you know, if he's able to sustain that, we're going to have a stronger dollar, and, and that's that's a great great news for for all domestic investors here. So, what do you think happens tomorrow? Right, you know, we're all wondering: is this is this a bottom? Is do we have further to fall, or are we going to swing? You know, do we swing back into the green? And, and today's just a blip in reaction to this, you know, bad inflation data. Um. <laughs> The uh, you know we 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 do our best to analyze the present, not predict the future. Uh, the market does have a funny way of uh, uh, of of going in the opposite direction that it did the day before, uh, though rarely in the same magnitude. Uh, there's also a, a ton of studies out there that also talk about the night effect and how you know most of the money that's actually made in the stock market happens when the stock market is closed, and that very well could happen uh, in a situation like this if if, if folks come in tomorrow. Uh, thinking the market is oversold. But you look at where we are in the quarter. It's we're, we're nearing the end of September. We're nearing the end of the third quarter. 
uh, companies are going to, uh, we're about four to five weeks away from another earnings season. Uh, and that's a really important one because we're now in that period of the year where you're already seeing growth rates accelerate. Adobe has been reporting e-commerce numbers that have been accelerating over the year before. Uh, they've been reporting relatively low uh, price inflation in digital goods specifically. So what you're going to be looking for in these earnings calls uh, just a month or so away is that businesses are continuing to report strong numbers in spite of some pretty challenging macro headlines. Uh, and so we're, we're reasonably, we feel reasonably good about the businesses that, that we're owning here going into the fourth quarter. And you don't get a lot of opportunities to buy companies of this magnitude with these growth rates and these cash flow margins uh, that you know, a lot of the tech space is right. offering right now. Robert Cantwell, Up Holdings Portfolio Manager. Always good to have you here, Robert. Thank you for stopping by. Coming up, traditional finance and blockchain collide. What is behind the new pilot project from SWIFT, the global secure messaging system for financial institutions, and what it means for people moving money everywhere? This is Bloomberg. Crypto reported big news in the world of finance today. Big news. SWIFT, the messaging system used by financial institutions globally to convey instructions on tens of millions of transactions every day, is testing out blockchain. Our crypto contributor, Shanali Basik, has more on this. Shanali, what exactly happened today? Well, uh, the idea here is that blockchain can be a key piece here of what is critical financial infrastructure. When you think about SWIFT, you don't think about it day to day, Emily, because it's really underlying the entire global financial system, barring a few regions, as we know. Remember, certain Russian banks were cut off from SWIFT in the wake of the start of the war in Ukraine. But remember, this does connect banks globally. It is essentially a lifeline between the banks in terms of uh, being a messaging system and a way to really kind of track what's going on uh, among different firms across countries around the world, hundreds of countries and thousands of messages routinely. So why does blockchain matter? Because this is something that is uh, involving a fintech company, Symbiont. It is involving Citigroup, which is one of the largest transaction banks in the world that also is one of the most global banks in the world, Vanguard, Northern Trust. And remember, these are all companies that deal a lot with the safety and security of just the movement of assets around the world. So the testing of blockchain would really be a potential to really upgrade critical infrastructure simply with how messaging and communication works just across financial institutions of so many types across the world. So how long will this pilot be running? And if it works, could we see a potential big change in the underlying technology here? Yeah, and listen, remember, I, the reason I brought up the Russia issue as well is because when uh, they were really cut off and certain institutions were cut off from SWIFT, there was a lot of concern, Emily, about Russia, China, really developing their own type of SWIFT or a rival to SWIFT to be able to develop their own critical infrastructure by means of technology uh, and other infrastructure to really start to communicate, to build a new, essentially, a financial system. And you do see uh, some traces of that and some acceleration of that this year. So the idea of using blockchain to really strengthen infrastructure among the SWIFT system itself, is there a potential? Yeah, absolutely. But you know, when you think about blockchain itself, there is a huge debate in the fintech community, in the banking community, is blockchain the best technology to really be used to communicate among all of these entities? And is it the safest? Is it the most secure? Because that's what it comes down to at the end. At the end of the day, remember, this is a way to really kind of put the network together Together, but at the end of the day, the banks and the financial institutions themselves are responsible for the data and the safety and security of that data. So uh, there are some applications that can really be helpful in the future. Clarity, tracking that data uh, in terms of the firms themselves, taking a look and seeing what's possible in terms of anti-money laundering, fraud within their own firms. But again, they have to make that decision, okay. Emily, if blockchain is the best means to do it. Fascinating. Thank you for breaking down that. Uh, some of this is wonky stuff uh, uh, and helping us better understand it. Bloomberg, Shanali, Bostic, uh, as always, appreciate it. Okay.
Coming up, how is the world doing when it comes to achieving equality and ending poverty? Well, things are slow, really slow. We're gonna hear from Melinda French Gates and Jamie Zimmerman of the Gates Foundation on how we can step up the pace next. This is Bloomberg. French Gates says the pandemic has stalled progress on critical issues like poverty and climate change, calling gender inequality the most alarming. This coming from new findings in the 2022 Goalkeepers Report released by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Back in March of last year, French Gates told me women were in crisis as the pandemic dragged on. I asked her about the state of women now. Take a listen to what she had to say. I would say still in crisis. You know, women's livelihoods were destroyed by the pandemic. Whether you were in the informal sector, maybe in South Africa, or whether you had a job, women are saying, I can't do my job at the same intensity as before or at all if I don't have safe and affordable childcare. That is just a problem. And so we've pushed women out of the workforce and we have so many girls across the world who are not in school anymore. How could a recession or a prolonged economic downturn make this worse? Well, it could mean, I mean, inflation also makes it worse, right? So that economic downturn, the fact that it's, you know, more expensive to get food or to get fuel means that we are seeing already more hunger around the world. And we're seeing because of Ukrainian crisis, you know, there's less food to support Africa. And so we're seeing even more families in a state of hunger and particularly women. Of all the people who are food insecure, three out of five are women. The report doesn't mention the overturning of Roe versus Wade, but you have made it clear that you think America has taken a huge step backwards. What is the foundation doing to support abortion rights? What are you doing at Pivotal to, to support abortion rights? And you know, where do you think the work and the urgency needs to be focused? Well, at the foundation, we're continuing to work on family planning, and that's for low and middle income countries because women are still crying out for that. And at Pivotal, I'm really focused on how do we get more women in political positions of power in the United States? We would not have these laws overturned if we had more females in our House of Congress and in our Senate. Of that, I'm certain. Now, when it comes to the foundation, you and Bill have said that if you found you could no longer work together, that you would step down as co-chair by 2023. How is your working dynamic evolved? Are you finding that you can continue to work together? And do you think you'll still be there next year when that deadline comes? So Bill and I have worked effectively together for a very long time, including while we were going through a difficult time in our family life and through a divorce. We showed up, we worked then and during the pandemic, and we do today. We now have a board. We met for the first time with our board of trustees last week in person. And what I think they would all tell you is that Bill and Melinda remain completely committed to this institution and to working effectively together. And that's what we're doing today. So how is the board going? I know you added uh, a few new board members, uh, up to four. You said you would, might consider adding more. Um, how has that changed the, the dynamic? And, and do you think you'll add any additional members? I think for right now, we have the board that we would like to have, and that's fantastic. We met for the first time. And the way it's changing the dynamic is they're pushing on our thinking, and that's what we wanted from a board. And we wanted good governance. It was just time. You know, Bill and I aren't getting any younger. And what I know is that the board asked fantastic questions last week about resource allocation, about partners, about our internal teams, and how we're working and incentivating and motivating them. So I'm really looking Looking forward to even more discussions with the board. I want to get back to that Gates Foundation report, the Goalkeepers report, which finds that almost every indicator of the UN Sustainable Development Goals is off track for achieving them by 2030. Jamie Zimmerman joins us now. She leads the foundation's work to increase low-income 
women's economic empowerment through access to and use of digital financial services. Jamie, thank you so much for joining us. So what is your big takeaway from this report, aside from we're moving way too slow? Yeah, thanks, Emily. So I think, you know, looking at the goalkeepers report that came out today, we um, are seeing big takeaway is that women have been taking a major hit. Gender equality uh, is, is stalling and falling behind. Melinda said it so well. And we are in a state right now where the hits just keep coming. We've got inflation, uh, in floods in Pakistan, climate related crises, food insecurity. And we're really looking for ways that we can find uh, new tools and interventions that can help us overcome some of these really difficult situations that we're finding ourselves in, um, the pressures that women are facing in labor force participation, inability to recover, looking for those points of light um, in the darkness, as right. Melinda had said. And I think, you know, the one point uh, that we are actually seeing progress uh, that we got to highlight in that goalkeepers report is, in gender equality is around financial access. And for the first time since we've been tracking this data and recording this data, we actually are, in the last year, seeing the gender gap in financial inclusion narrowing. And that's during even this really challenging time. Uh, and it looks like a lot of that is due to growth of mobile money, especially in developing countries and, uh, and women taking up mobile money services in the last couple of years. Talk to us about what you mean by mobile money, because you're talking about this as a tool that can help uh, increase uh, gender equity. What do you mean by that? And how does it work? How is it working? Yeah, so mobile money is essentially a basic financial product that you can access on a basic phone with basic connectivity. That's essentially a service that is in large part provided by your network operator. Uh, and so it is a, a financial tool um, that where you can receive money, send money, maybe even save a little bit of money. And in the developing world, tons of interesting innovations that are happening um, with mobile money where it's connecting to other types of uh, tools and things that women need, like the ability to pay for healthcare services, to pay her, uh, children's education fees, to buy goods and services, to sell her own goods and services if she has a small business, pay utility bills, um, even pay your toll um, when you're driving down the highway in Nairobi. So it's a it's a it's an alternative to bank-based financial services that we're seeing in the developing world. And it's and it's very popular because the barriers to entry for a mobile money account are much lower than a bank account. And there are, you know, the majority of people in the world, still 84, 85%, have a phone, whether it's a basic phone all the way to a smartphone in their hand. So you can bank on your phone without it being a bank account that usually has more stringent requirements for opening that account. Okay. And those types of stringent requirements tend to be uh, disadvantages for women. Well, it's good to know that on at least one measure, things are getting better. That said, you know, horrible day in the public markets today, you know, new numbers that show inflation is still rising. Um, how much do you worry a prolonged downturn could set women back even further than they've already been set back? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're seeing a lot of pressure on women. I. You know, I think what we're seeing is that digital tools and being able to participate in the digital economy and the new digital future that we see coming. We saw massive acceleration of digitization globally in the last couple of years. It is going to be through being able to fully participate equally in the economy of the future that is going to help move us from you know, just trying to keep track and not fall too far behind and maybe recover a little bit to be actually becoming like a resilient, robust economy and society. And that's true everywhere in the world. So we need a gender equal digital future. We need to have women on equal footing with both access to digital tools, access to digital the digital economy, and equal footing on the ability to use the digital tools that are 
out there um, and that are coming. And I think through all of that is where we're going to see a lot of acceleration in the pace of change. Mo we saw mobile money accelerate in the last couple of years because we found ways to make it accessible to women to meet their needs to try to get that equality and access. And it's helped women not only okay. get through this challenging time, but to actually recover out of it. And so I think it's going to be an kind of an multi all hands on deck approach that we're going to have to take in order to ensure that the tools of the future are things that are right. in women's hands and made for women. And I think that that's going to be what gets us through to the next uh, more resilient uh, future that we're going to need to right. find ourselves. Well, here is to progress and faster progress. Uh, thanks for shining a light on this. Jamie Zimmerman, Deputy Director of Digital Connectivity and Gender Equality at the Gates Foundation. That does it for this edition of the show. I'm Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg.